be sure to watch the first part uh, of this series. In the previous part, I discussed the formation of narcissism and its emergence uh, on the individual level as a clinical diagnostic entity, and how narcissists actually broke out of the individual framework and the family and became a societal or civilizational or cultural organizing principle which imbues our lives with meaning and therefore qualifies to be a new faith. I proposed in the first part that narcissism is a new, technologically driven, networked religion and that God in the new faith of narcissism is distributed. Each and every one of the nodes in the network is a god. We are all gods empowered by technology. And as we feel godlike, uh, we act as gods. We uh, worship essentially ourselves. We sacrifice our true selves to the false self. We collaborate in ad hoc self-assembled networks to achieve goals exactly as the brain does with neural pathways. There is a similarity or almost identity between the way the brain operates and our civilization operates. And this new distributed uh, religion, this new faith, not only explains the world to us, but provides us with useful tools, pre prescriptions and proscriptions on behaviors, on conduct, helps us uh, to conduct ourselves, to navigate ourselves in the dangerous, hostile waters of this ocean that is called life. However, this raises a series, a host of questions. Uh, the first question that arises is, how did narcissism develop? How did it propagate? How did it become a pandemic? How did it so happen that narcissism, which started as a, an individual clinical diagnostic entity, how did it become a global faith and a global religion? My name is Sam Batlin, and I'm the author of Malignant self Love, Narcissism Revisited. And today, we're going to discuss the missionary aspects of narcissism. Narcissism, um, the narcissist relies on something called the false self. The false self is a construct, a piece of fiction, a confabulation, which the narcissist creates uh, in early childhood years. The idea is that the false self will serve as a deity. It will be as strong as God himself. It will be a God. And it will protect the narcissist. Remember, it's a child. So it will protect the narcissist by deflecting the pain and the hurt and by being all-powerful and all-knowing, brilliant and perfect. The narcissist then proceeds to invest all his emotional energy and to get attached to and to bond with the false self. We call this process cathexis. But here's the problem. The false self, of course, is false. Even the child realizes that the false self, being so fantastically grandiose, is in conflict with a lot of information that is coming from reality, is in conflict with reality itself. In other words, the false self fails the reality test. What to do? How to reconcile the false self-falseness with the need to preserve it as a working hypothesis, as an organizing principle, as an explanatory dimension in the narcissist's life. How, how can the narcissist, when he grows up, when he, when he becomes 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, how can the narcissist continue to have um, the false self when he realizes that the false self is sometimes derisive, uh, that it's false, that it's... Uh, um, not very defensible, shall we say. And what the narcissist does, it coerces people, it cajoles people, it begs people, it forces people to provide him with something called narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply is attention in all its forms. It could be positive attention, adulation, admiration, affirmation, applause, or it could be negative attention being feared, for example, or being hated. As long as the narcissist noticed, he doesn't really care. Now, narcissistic supply has many functions which I will not go into. One of them is to maintain and regulate the narcissist's sense of self-worth, but to maintain it and regulate it in a pathological way. 
Put differently, the main aim or the main goal of narcissistic supply is to convince the narcissist that the false self is not false, that it's actually real. So the narcissist uh, goes to, to people and says, am I not brilliant? Am I not a genius? Or he says, am I not handsome? Or he says, don't you think that my accomplishments are outstanding? These constant solicitations, this constant eliciting of feedback to support the grandiose outlines, contours of the false self, this constant process of begging for narcissistic supply is actually missionary. What do religions, established religions do, with the exception of Judaism? They are missionary. They send people out, they send missionaries, they send priests, they send preachers to convert other people to their point of view. If you're a Christian evangelist, you would try to convert non-believers, atheists, secularists. You would try to convert them to the true faith. You would try to make them believe in the reality of Jesus. If you're a Muslim, you would do the same. Establish religions, churches, try to convert people. The more, the bigger the number of believers, the better off the church, the better off economically, and the better off in terms of power. It's all, of course, about power and money, ultimately. So, established religions are missionary. Narcissism is not different. Each and every narcissist is trying to convert you to his point of view. The narcissist believes that he is omnipotent, all-powerful. He be truly believes that he is all-knowing, that he can learn nothing from no one. He truly believes that he is brilliant, and perfect, and impeccably handsome. And he wants you to tell him, yes, it's all true. He wants you to be converted to the true faith. He wants you to become a believer in his version of himself, in his false self. The narcissist wants you to suspend your judgment. The narcissist wants you to divorce reality and join his one-man cult. But not as a member, God forbid, because membership is limited to the narcissist only. Not as a member, as a worshipper. The narcissist wants you to worship with him the Godhead, the false self, by kowtowing to the false self, by acknowledging the reality of the false self, by telling the narcissist that the false self is actually a pretty realistic rendition of the narcissist, the narcissist gains affirmation, gains validation, gains confirmation that his false self is the truth, the only truth. And what is religion about if it's not about the truth, the revealed truth? So this is the missionary uh, aspect and dimension of narcissism. Every narcissist forms a cult. And in this cult, there is a Godhead, which is the false self. In the cult, there's one believer, which is the narcissist. This, the narcissist has a special relationship with the false self, exactly as Christians, some Christians, have a spe special relationship with Jesus. And the narcissist leverages, uses this special relationship to feel good, to learn how to conduct himself in daily life, in his environment to guarantee achievements and accomplishments, a fulfilled life, to feel morally superior, to do, to fulfill all the functions that classical religion provides. Narcissists can never be true believers in God. They already have a God, and the God is they. The new religion of narcissism, as I've explained, is the first network distributed religion, the first network distributed faith. It's a faith where each node in the network, each member of the congregation, each ad ad adherent, each believer, each parishioner, is God himself. Each narcissist is God by virtue of having this liaison, having this direct access to the false self. So each narcissist is God. Put together, all of them are the God. So narcissism is a, a concept of God which renders the narcissist equal to God, identical to God.
It's identity politics in a way. The narcissist is God and God is the narcissist. Where do we go from there? If each and every one of us is, is a God and put together in ad hoc self-assembling networks, we become, we become even bigger gods. Where does it leave non-believers, people who refuse to believe in the narcissist religion? And where does it leave humanity or mankind? Should narcissism become the prevalent religion, as I believe? I believe that in 50 to 100 years, the number one religion would be narcissism. Islam and Christianity would be considered add-ons, plug-ins, tacked upon the foundation of narcissism. Narcissism will be like the master religion, and other religions will be like uh, uh, coats of painting on the, on the foundation of religion. So where does this leave humanity? Well, let's do the first question. If you refuse to believe in the narcissist and in his false self, you set yourself up for vengeance and retribution. The narcissist, like every good zealot, like every good uh, militant religious fundamentalist, does not forget and does not forgive. In this sense, every narcissist is a mini-terrorist. If you do not accept his version of reality, if you do not worship his God, if you do not affirm and confirm the reality of that God, the validity of that God, if you don't tell the narcissist, yes, you are a divinity, you are a deity, you are godlike, you are the manifestation of, of godly attributes on earth, if you don't tell the narcissist that, if you don't engage in idolatry with the narcissist at its center as an idol, you shall be punished. And the punishment has myriad faces. Anything from silent treatment to being killed, literally. Narcissists will go to any length to force you to become a source of narcissistic supply. To force you to become a believer in the false god, which is the only god in the narcissist world. And if you refuse to become a believer, then you are a heretic an apostate, and we know what established religions did to heretics and apostates. They burned them at the stake. Narcissists will either then avoid you and shun you altogether, dump you, or they will punish you if they have no other choice but to remain in touch with you. And what will happen to mankind, to humanity? If I'm right in a hundred years from now, the main and only religion would be self-worship, narcissism. Each and every person will consider himself God or God-like. Empowered by technology, people will possess God-like powers. It will be very difficult to convince them that they are not God, because they will have God-like powers. What will happen to mankind if each and every one of us is a God? If each and every one of us has his or her own way of interpreting existence and life, of conducting his or herself in society, of interacting with other people via interpersonal relationships, proscription and prescriptions, etc., etc. What happens when we have uh, 10 billion competing religions, all of them claiming to be the only true religion, all of them demanding special treatment, all of them feeling entitled, all of them reacting with rage, fury, passive aggression and outright aggression, to any denial or any countervailing information, all of them involved in a confirmation bias, all of them within bubbles. What will happen in this atomized, anomic view of the future of mankind? Well, there will be no mankind, simply. The very concept of mankind is very new. Many of the concepts we use habitually and we think hail back to time immemorial are actually very new. Take, for example, the concept of childhood. It's very new. Take the concept of romantic love. It's very new. Take the concept of mankind, of humanity. It's very new. It's actually three or four hundred years old. Prior to the, prior to the um, invention of the concept of mankind and humanity, people belonged to religious communities. They defined themselves via, their, via God and via their relationship to God. Ritualistic, established relationship through the church and personal relationship in outside the church. 
Everything was mediated via the agency of God, and God was the only agency. And there was no other way to understand the world, except through God. So what will happen is, we will revert to very ancient and primitive, primitive forms of organization. And I'm not talking about construction projects or technology. This will continue forever. That's not the issue. I'm talking about interpersonal, human, interhuman relationships. I'm talking about relationships between people. I'm talking about communities, the ways we organize ourselves, families and so on. All this will be gone and will become for good. We will, we will have become self-contained, self-sufficient, godlike, divine entities. And we will make human sacrifices to our deity, ourselves, our true selves, but also increasingly everyone else.